Lecture is titled, Endless Forms Most Beautiful. And now to introduce our program, the president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Check. Welcome to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and to our 2005 Holiday Lectures on Science, the 13th in our annual series. We're webcasting here live uh, from our HHMI headquarters in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and with us in the audience are 200 high school students from throughout the greater Washington, D.C. area. The mission of HHMI is to make discoveries in biomedical sciences and to foster uh, vibrant science education. And nothing brings these two activities together as well as having our Hughes investigators speaking to local high school students. To learn more about the Institute, go to our website, hhmi.org. Our important topic for these lectures is evolution. It's safe to say that all of HHMI's research activities depend on the central unifying concept of evolution. Evolution is as fundamental and as central to modern biology as the law of gravity or the law of conservation of energy is to physics. In the year 2000, I had the opportunity to travel through the Galapagos Islands and to see the sparse landscape and the exotic plants and animals that inspired uh, Charles Darwin's great idea. And similarly, a lot of researchers who are particularly drawn to evolution tend to enjoy natural history and field biology. Our lecturers for this series, Sean Carroll and David Kingsley, are no exception. Although they earn their bread and butter in the research laboratory, they also spend time in the field, hunting fossils, chasing animals, studying habitats. Our first speaker, Sean Carroll, is an HHMI investigator at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Sean trained in molecular biology and became interested in how genes control embryonic development. As Sean's work in developmental genetics progressed, he began to appreciate the key role that these same genes played in the evolution of species, and he became one of the main contributors to a new field called EVO-DEVO, which stands for Evolutionary Developmental Biology. His passion for EVO-DEVO led him recently to write a popular book, Endless Forms Most Beautiful, and in fact this is the title that he's chosen for his first lecture. Here to introduce our speaker is a short video. I think my interest in science started as a little kid when I would like to stroll out into the backyard and flip over logs and I just liked looking for critters and I love the visceral thrill you got from flipping over a log or turning over a rock and seeing an animal you'd never seen before and uh, appreciating how they live, their patterns, their body forms, etc. I always had this sense that I was going to be interested in biology. And as I started to learn about how biologists worked, and then as I entered college and had the opportunity to work in labs and all that, I knew I was on the right path. I was clearly interested in understanding the machinery of how nature works, uh, how cells work, how genes work. And so the first phase of my career was devoted towards understanding some of the mysteries ongoing in the field called developmental biology, which is the study of how adults develop from eggs. Uh, but I understood also there was a deep connection between that area and the evolution of form, because all form evolves by changes in development. So by understanding development, you understand something about evolution. And I've been working at that interface for a long time. All of the ideas about evolution are important to human health because we are living species, we are variable, we have been and are subject to forces like natural selection, and so part of our genetic makeup has been sculpted by battles in the past with the pathogens that we've encountered as humans spread across the globe. So we are an evolved and still evolving species. 
in the most practical aspects, uh, our medical lives are intertwined with evolution because we're in a constant arms race with the pathogens that affect us. My goal for the holiday lectures is to arouse interest in natural history and enrich students' appreciation for the process of evolution. Evolution is the big idea in biology and life is of course the big experiment on Earth. So there's really no bigger idea to get your head around. And for those of us who spend a couple of decades trying to understand what individual organisms do, what species are, how they change, um, what are their relationships to each other, it's a very large and still expanding subject. Good morning. You're going to hear a lot about evolution over the next two days. I think you're going to hear a lot of new things about evolution over the next two days. I think Dr. Kingsley and I have agreed that perhaps the vast majority of what you hear is not even in textbooks yet. And it's a sign of the vigor of evolutionary science in 2005. But all of this science has deep roots. Deep roots that started in a very dramatic way in the 19th century. And so our discussion of evolution today is going to begin with Charles Darwin. For, as we'll see, his contributions were immense. And they have endured and been expanded upon now for 150 years. And I think his contributions, even scientists don't realize the scope of his work until you actually dig into the many books, the many contributions that he made over a life's work. So in this first lecture, I'm going to tell you about Darwin's key ideas and how he arrived at them. And in the following lectures, Dr. Kingsley and I are going to focus on the expanding understanding of how evolution works. So let's start with Charles Darwin. I'll say perhaps one of the misunder most misunderstood characters in the history of science. And I hope in the next 15 or 20 minutes you're going to gain a better appreciation of just who this person was. Was this greatest of all naturalists always destined for greatness? Hardly. Now among the high school students here in the audience, how many of you are pondering a medical career of some sort? Show with your hand. A very high percentage, okay. So was Charles Darwin until he saw surgery for the first time. And surgery in the early 19th century was not the very sterile process that you see on television in 2005. It was a very uh, rapid process because without anesthesia, the idea was to uh, get it over with quickly before the patient um, objected too strenuously. So uh, Darwin not only wasn't comfortable with surgery, he wasn't comfortable with the sight of blood. He had a fairly queasy stomach. Um, so after two years of medical school that he started at age 16, he washed out, and it was clearly not going to be the thing for him. And he changed colleges, and he moved to the University of Cambridge, and he took up some of his passions, which were natural history, beetle collecting, running around the countryside. He was a good shot. He was a good horseman. Um, he enjoyed a lot of hobbies. He was brought up in a fairly wealthy household, the son of a physician. He enjoyed certain advantages. He liked reading, and he read about particularly earlier British naturalists who had explored the tropics. And being in dank, gray... Now, his wealthy father, fearing that his son was amounting to nothing, uh, just enjoying himself and not setting his talents to anything serious, his options were relatively limited in that day and age since he wasn't going to be a physician. And the more respectable option would be, for example, for Charles to join the clergy. And so that's what Darwin's father chose for him, that he would enter divinity school at Cambridge, um, study divinity, and become, for example, a country parson. And he would be able to then uh, take his natural history pursuits living out in the country sort of as a hobby. So that was the plan. Yes, the clergy. That's where Darwin was headed. But fate intervened, and Darwin, while he was preparing to study divinity, was unexpectedly offered the chance to voyage as a ship's naturalist with the British Navy. 